Bueno, pues buenas tardes y bienvenidos y bienvenidas al segundo diálogo del ciclo 2023-24. Hoy nos acompaña Adrián Smith, que es investigador en tecnología y sociedad de la Universidad de Sussex. También es investigador eh, asociado de ITDUPM y, y amigo. Tiene incluso su, su altar ahí fuera de, con un cuadro. Y... Bueno, el tema del diálogo es eh, cómo abordar los desafíos de la digitalización y lograr sociedades bajas en, en emisiones de manera inclusiva y justa. Y además nos contará las claves para eh, ser eh, un consumidor de energía inteligente. Luego habrá un espacio, como en todos los diálogos, para que podamos preguntar. Y bueno, Carlos, ahora os, os detalla un poquito más sobre, sobre ella. Y nada, bienvenidos y gracias por venir. Gracias, Mónica. No, le he pedido a Mónica que me, que me deje contaros algunas cosas sobre Adrian, eh, porque es una persona que ha influido muchísimo en que el ITD sea lo que, lo que soy. Eh, y bueno, pues eh, hace tiempo, como nos ha recordado Mónica, tuvimos el gusto de tenerle durante casi un año aquí en, sí. en España. Fue una, una estancia importantísima para quienes entonces estábamos... <risa> Empezando a, a dar forma al ITD tal como es hoy y, y bueno, pues yo quería eh, pues, pues eso, de, de contaros dos o tres cositas que me parecen importantes para que eh, eh, sepáis con quién, con quién estamos. Y antes, por supuesto, daros las gracias de, pese a la convocatoria que hemos hecho muy rápida y muy... Eh, eh, un poco, con, con poco tiempo para reaccionar, pese a que está hace un día un poco raro y que estamos en unos días de un montón de actividades, pues que estéis aquí. Habéis elegido bien, ¿eh? Entonces tenemos que elegir, a veces tomamos malas decisiones. Viniendo a ver a Adrián, habéis tomado una, una buena decisión. Adrián, muchas de las personas que nos acompañan aquí las conoces, que son eh, colaboradores, investigadores del ITD de, de, desde hace tiempo, a otras no. En general son eh, personas que están... Eh, o iniciándose eh, en su segundo año de máster como investigadores en el ITD o son personas que nos acompañan en la nueva edición que tenemos este año de máster. Sí. Eh, como, como sabes, además, muchas de ellas vienen de otros países, todo América sí. Latina, pero no, pero no solo. Y la primera cosa que os quería contar de él es que yo también viajé a otro país distinto, a una universidad que no era la mía, y sé lo, lo difícil que es pues, pues entrar y que te hagan caso y sentirte pues, en una comunidad. Eh, y no simplemente que vas a un sitio, te dejan un despacho y, y ahí te las arregles. Eh, yo hace ya, creo que fueron nueve años, empecé una primera estancia en la Universidad de Sussex, donde hay un instituto de desarrollo muy conocido, IDS, y donde hay también eh, un centro de innovación y política pública, SPRU, que es el centro luego Adrián nos puede contar, en el que Adrián ya, ya entonces estaba. Y me encontré además con una iniciativa preciosa que unía a gente que venía del ámbito del development con gente que venía del ámbito de las políticas de ciencia e innovación. Y pues nada, como os pasará a vosotras, te pones un poco a, a ver quién es quién, a, a preguntar, a tocar una puerta a otra y, y me encontré con, con Adrián que además eh, él siempre ha estado muy interesado por el, eh, por el español y por el América Latina. De hecho, eh, ya entonces eh, hablaba bastante bien español. Es de los pocos ingleses, tengo que decir, que hace, han hecho el esfuerzo de entender <coughs> nuestro, sí. nuestro idioma sí. y además sí, hacerlo también. maravillosamente. Aunque hoy le hemos pedido que eh, por, por fluidez y porque se sienta cómodo la charla la de en inglés, luego ya en la, la conversación vais a ver cómo habla uh, maravillosamente. Y entonces, bueno, pues fue la, la persona que a mí me, me acogió. Entonces, espero que tengáis todos la misma suerte. Eh, hablamos muchas veces aquí en el ITD que sois cada promoción más de 40 personas y a veces nos queda la cosa de que no podemos atender de verdad a todo el mundo que, que quiere. Y es, es así, es así. Vamos a hacer todo lo posible. Ahora vamos a organizar un alumni con todos los alumnos que estuvieron otros años aquí. Pero esa, 
esa cuestión de, de acoger, de, que, de crear espacios donde la gente pueda sentirse eh, parte de una comunidad está en la esencia de lo que quiere hacer el ITD. Eh, a veces le sale bien, a veces le sale peor, pero es un, un elemento fundamental. Y nos tenemos que apoyar unos a otros porque todos sabemos, yo creo que en esta sala todo el mundo sabe eh, lo, lo difícil y lo importante que es eh, cuando se cambia a un lugar que no es el suyo, eh, tener ese, ese afecto y esa empatía que yo tuve eh, en Adrian. Eh, estuve primero en AIDES y dos años después tuve la oportunidad de tener otra estancia en, en Spru. La segunda cosa, y ya es la última, de Adrian, es que él me tu, tu, tuve conversaciones realmente transformadoras con, con Adrian y él siempre tuvo muchísima paciencia conmigo ¿eh? porque yo eh, pues soy más practitioner que researcher eh, porque yo soy más posibilista y, y reformista seguramente que la tradición de la innovación social, etcétera, de la que él venía y Adrian siempre pude hablar con él con toda franqueza y eso tampoco es, es fácil, encontrarte con, con gente en un departamento en el que ya hay asentadas unas ideas y una forma de ver el mundo que acepta, no solo acepta, sino que le interesa eh, una perspectiva diferente. Por otro lado, yo nunca quise que el ITD fuera como Spru. Yo creo que Spru cumplía su función, estaba en un país determinado, en un momento histórico distinto, yo quería que el ITD fuera uh, distinto y, y sin complejos, sin complejos de tener mucha menos producción eh, en aquel momento, infinitamente menos en research, eh, pero sabiendo que aquí se daban las condiciones para a, a hacer otras cosas que podían ser interesantes para él. Y tuvo la gentileza de venir un año, que fue un reconocimiento hacia nosotros, de estar un año aquí en, en España, viendo cómo trabajábamos para gente que de luego ha ido haciendo su carrera investigadora, sus tesis doctorales, pues como Jaime Moreno, que le conocéis, Miguel, que no nos puede acompañar ahora porque está fuera, la propia Irene que entra. Eh, eh, Adrian nos, nos ayudó a ir abriendo, eh, abriéndonos a la investigación, eh, a entender que lo que estábamos haciendo en las plataformas que ya conocéis casi todos podía ser objeto de la, de la investigación. Y entonces... Su, su presencia aquí fue fundamental para, para eso. Y nada, son, pues es, es un gusto recibir a un amigo siempre que, que vuelve a, a visitarte. Eh, y bueno, yo espero que tengamos una sesión que sea más que un diálogo habitual, que sea también un momento en el que a, como excusa tenemos su presentación, pero que podamos también abrir un poco y compartir inquietudes sobre estos temas. Gracias, Adrian. Y... Eh, the, the floor is yours. Bueno, sí, tengo este... Me has dado la palabra. Bueno, gracias. Y... Bueno, um, gracias, Carlos. No, no sé qué decir después de esta introducción. Es un, es un lujo y... Un... Sí, estoy muy contento de estar aquí um, otra vez um, desde hace cinco años o más. ¿sí? Y cada vez es un privilegio aprender, ¿sí? Entonces, desde mi punto de vista, este, esta relación entre la práctica y la reflexión, digamos, investigación, que es, es, es dinámica, es, es, es la manera en la que podemos aprender y mejorar el mundo, ¿no? Es, es muy, muy importante. Y, y lo importante es, es respetar las diferencias al mismo tiempo de, de identificar lo que podemos hacer en común, ¿sí? Es, es, es lo importante. Um, esta vez, bueno, voy a dejarlo aquí, porque okay, faltamos un poco de tiempo. Entiendo que mi llegada a, he, he llegado a un momento muy, bueno, mi, mi, mi estancia aquí, cada día fue algo diferente, que, es, que se pasó y estas cosas, muchas, muchísimas dinámicas. Entonces, me costó un par de años para recuperarme después de la estancia, de verdad. Y, y entiendo que siguen esta dinámica. Y mañana hay un, un, una reunión muy, muy importante entre los demás. Entonces, gracias por tenerme de visita aquí. La idea originalmente fue simplemente venir a hablar con amigos y amigos viejos y viejas, conocer a, a caras nuevas también, y, y ya, ya está. Pero Miguel me, me, me preguntó si me gustaría hacer un diálogo improbable. Entonces, estoy aquí. Y de verdad, es, es una innovación. Porque este, entonces, es un, un diálogo imprevisto. 
<risa> Entonces, por ese, pido tus, um, ¿cómo se dice? Voy a hablar en, en inglés. Entonces, es una presentación en las diapositivas, están en inglés y no he tenido el, el tiempo para, no sé, prepararme en español, ¿sí? Ok. So, I'm going start in English. I'm trying a little bit slowly. So, the theme of the presentation is developing smart local energy systems. This is a project that's just finishing and that we've been running for um, just over nearly three years, I think. Oh, brilliant. Thank you, Monica. Gracias. Um, and so all I'm going to do is just tell you a little bit about the project, the sort of themes we've been investigating, what we've learned, uh, and, and opened up for questions. I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail because I know the idea is to have a, a, a dialogue, yeah? Um, the presentation, the project, sorry. Come over. Where do I point for the, our, our value? See, yeah. value. Okay, so... Um, before we do, so where I work, the Science Policy Research Unit, we have quite a large group of people who an energy group as well. So a lot of social scientists uh, and engineers who work on energy transitions and qu social questions about how do we bring about energy transitions. We don't do the engineering part, the developing of the technologies. It's more trying to understand the um, social conditions under which these technologies might actually start to work, if you like, yeah? And so that's what I'm going to do now with this idea of smart local energy systems. I'll explain what they are in a moment. Um, and I... Or I can just say, if you want to... Yeah, here it's okay on the wall. En la pared está bien. Pero en la tele no. Ah, sí. Okay. So... The project was, was part of a larger project, so called ROLES, which stands for Responsive Organizing for Low Emission Societies. Okay, And the idea was to do social scientific analysis of how to make the digitalization of local energy systems. That's to say using digital technologies to get more information about energy generation and energy use locally on networks. Uh, Obviously, in Europe, in many countries, a lot of interest in how to use these technologies to create new energy systems that are about zero carbon emissions that better match local renewable energy generation with trying to change patterns of demand in households, etc. Okay, to integrate and manage technologies better. And so the aim with the Rolls project was to analyze to what extent these innovations are inclusive. Are they including different kinds of households, different social actors? How are they accountable? Because as soon as we get into questions of digitalization, there's all sorts of data that's being created and information about people in their homes. What can you infer from data about the way that they use uh, energy in the home, et cetera? Who owns that data, okay? How to be accountable for managing that better. Uh, and then this fair digitalization in the end, in the sense of, um, questions of social justice, okay? Who's who's benefiting from these new systems that people are trying to introduce, et cetera. So that was the, these were the kind of themes that we were trying to investigate in three different case studies in three different countries or, or cities. So I don't know if you can see, there was a team in Bergen in Norway that were looking at what we call smart mobility, okay? So intelligent mobility uh, led by Sid Serene. In Italy, in Trento, we had, um, uh, Sonia leading a team looking at smart meters. And then in Brighton in the UK, we were looking at something called smart local energy systems. Okay, And there was a team of us whose name you can see there. People came in and did specific roles and, and left a bit. And the methods we used was essentially 
reviewing very various policy documents and industrial strategies for developing these systems. Because it's important to remember these systems don't really exist yet. They're just demonstration projects, et cetera, I'll, I'll talk about it. We undertook interviews with expert, experts and different stakeholders that were involved in, in developing these systems. We looked at the reports and what was, had been learned from certain demonstration programs. And then also we did a number of community interviews in Brighton with households who, who kind of had some exposure to these systems. And we organized stakeholder workshops as well. So these are the methods that we use to gather as much information as we could about, in Brighton, smart local energy systems. And it's really on the basis of that information and how we analyzed it that I'm gonna tell you what we've, what we've learned, what's been happening in the UK. Uh, but I think that may have not necessarily lessons for other cities and places like here in Madrid, but given that certainly within the European Union, we talk a lot about the, the, the twin transition, digitalization and decarbonization, and energy is a key sector for doing that, then maybe some of the concepts, methods, like what we've learned from the UK so far may be you know, of relevance or interest. And I really welcome questions. So if there's anything you don't understand as I go along, feel free to ask, or we can have a, a dialogue afterwards. Here, this is one slide that explains UK energy policy and how this twin transition is going to happen in theory, okay, or the policy makers see it. Maybe I'll come over here. So you have here on the, on the left, the, the three Ds. So decarbonization is the first goal. Decentralization of the energy system. So move away from large fossil fuel energy centers or gas fired in a national grid that's with a few um, private utility companies and a single regular, something that's much more decentralized. And then enabling the first two Ds is the third D, which is digitalization, okay? People are nodding, so I assume it's relatively familiar. So for decarbonization, using diverse renewable energy technologies, so things from like small hydro plants to solar panels on rooftops of different sizes, uh, wind energy and so far, moving from gas heating so we, we keep our homes warm in the UK, but mainly with use, using gas to heat water for central heating. Move from that to using heat pumps, okay? Uh, and greater electricity storage with batteries, either in neighborhoods or in homes or at larger scale. Obviously the shift to electric vehicles is an important policy goal. Where's all that electricity going to come from? Without melting the local electricity grid and so forth. And then more importantly, to enable all this, like reducing energy, so energy conservation and this land side management. So that's the decarbonization goals. And then with decentralization, actually changing the, the governance a little bit. So greater use of local energy planning, try and promote innovative new companies into energy markets, change energy behaviors as well. So households, rather than just being like passive consumers of electricity, you know, you come home, you put on the light switch, the idea of energy prosumer, so you become a producer of energy, uh, of electricity in your home and selling it into the local grid by, um, you know, having solar panels on your home and, and so forth. You know, something. And then digitalization is making use of digital technologies like smart meters to generate more and better data about electricity demand in real time, yeah, and be able to understand what's going on in, in homes uh, with, with much greater detail. Also to, through digitalization to great, generate much greater knowledge, information and data about what's going on on the local electricity networks as well. Uh, what's happening with all of those solar panels on people's rooftops or on the, the tops of apartment buildings? How much electricity are they generating at what points of time? What's the weather gonna do? Is it gonna, how, if it's gonna become brighter or more sunny? What does that mean in terms of electricity that's available and so forth? Yeah, so much greater data. And so therefore enabling us to anticipate better, that is Monica, um, what demand is going to look like in two hours time, the next day and so forth. And so basically have greater control over the local electricity grid. This is the sort of engineering kind of vision. Uh, and these are the kind of three building blocks for changing the UK energy system. And smart local energy systems, as I will say, are an important component of this. But that is against a, um, a backdrop 
of, of a kind of crisis of energy in the UK, as in with many other countries. We have um, tremendous fuel poverty, more than 7 million uh, households. There are around, in the UK, we have about 28 million households, yeah, like homes in the UK. More than 7 million, it's probably around 9 million of them now are in fuel poverty. There's a lot of households that can't afford uh, decent levels of, of, of energy in their homes. We obviously have the climate emergency. There's low public trust in energy suppliers. There's been a number of different scandals and with costs going up and companies making tremendous profits from that. And so public trust in energy companies rarely goes above 50%. Okay, so there's a lot of trust problems. And then there are also market failures. The markets are fa failing to kind of um, uh, bring about the energy transition. So there are questions and debates not so much in the policy world, but in you know, the public discourse, if you like, whether new models are needed for energy, new ownership models, new governance models, whether we need social and institutional innovation as much as the technological innovation, okay? And whether these, these technologies and things like digitalization may enable us to come up with new social innovations for how energy is bought and sold or understood and used, et cetera. And I'll go into that a little bit more. There are debates about whether households are not just consumers of energy, but actually should be seen as citizens of energy, have some say and be able to participate in important decisions about the future of energy. And then there's the whole question of the just transition, how to make sure this leaves no one behind. So there's a whole social world, if you like, around what's happening technologically and what's happening in terms of investment in these new digital smart energy systems around participation, trust and fairness, how we understand energy in our lives as well, if we're going to have to change the way we relate to energy, for example, and in our workplaces, and then building public legitimacy and accountability for these changes. OK, which are going to be really profound, actually, and that we're going to feel in very, very, very strongly. So that's the kind of um, the context for our study, if you like. Or well, these are the first things we learned when we started sort of looking into, into this stuff. So now I'm going to go into introduce the idea of smart local energy systems. I don't know what we would call them here in, in Madrid or, or in Spanish. <coughs> But these are a really important kind of building block, a really important element in the energy policy of the UK. Okay, the idea to, to, in decentralizing the energy systems and using zero forms of carbon, zero emissions or decarbonizing the technologies for energy and changing the, the patterns of use of electricity and energy in the home and in the workplace. The idea of the smart local energy system has been really, really important. Okay. The government has invested over 100 million pounds in various projects that's been met by the industry as well and what we've had in the uk is a whole series of demonstration projects in different neighborhoods and different cities around the country some quite small and specific some very very big to try and recruit households to participate in experiments with some of these new technologies okay so you may get a household for example that is given or can buy at low cost solar panels, uh, battery storage, okay, and digital controls in the home to try and run and operate the household appliances and, and in different ways, okay, and to allow the automation. So basically, you have some computer software that will manage when to um, take the electricity that's being generated from the solar panels. When is it better to store it in the battery in the home? When is it better to kind of to use it? So maybe to switch on the washing machine so that you're washing your clothes when there's a lot of daylight, okay? Um, or when is it better to sell the electricity to, to, to the local network, okay? And distribute it in some way. But that's the kind of how households are, are being, are seen to be playing a much greater and more active role in the production of energy systems in the future, okay? It's no longer just, electricity flows down into the home and they, they pay for the electricity they use. Now it's much, much, much more dynamic. We're expected to do much more work and to invest some of our money in these new technologies and become a much more interactive, smart energy customer in, in the home. Okay, you get the image. And you can imagine 
there's all sorts of new organizations, new actors, social actors that get involved in this. <clears throat> so you may have companies that run virtual power plants. The idea that you know they own collections of panels across different houses in, in the neighborhood in, in the city. And they they kind of it's like a distributed power station. So rather than them investing in a big coal-fired power station as they would historically, now they own their, their, their power station is spread across different roofs in the city and they, they sell the electricity and generate it like that. Okay. You have larger scale energy storage with batteries is part of the vision as well. So you can use that to um, meet electricity demand when there's less renewable electricity available and so forth. So you get all sorts of very complicated um, new arrangements. And this is what the demonstration projects have been experimenting with. Most of the experimentation has been looking at getting the technology right, thinking about the engineering sides of this, thinking about the business sides of it. Very little of the research, this is what we found, of these demonstrations, has been thinking about this in terms of the, the household. Okay, so that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit more now. But maybe just try and remember this, this, this diagram. And actually, one thing we learned, I'll come back to this, was it was very difficult to find an image of a smart energy system in, the, in all of the reports and the, all the documents we were looking at. Most pictures just had technology. You know, here's this and this, and there'd be some arrows. And there were no, no people in, in the pictures. So we had to um, get a, uh, a, an art, a graphic designer to create this image for us to use in a workshop. And we asked the participants in the workshop to kind of put post-it notes on, on this. But, you know, we said, OK, we'd like to put, you know, some people who are involved in local energy planning, some energy activists and, and so on and so forth. But even this is still very technical and, and dry. Yeah. OK. Oh. No bad. Could you press the next slide, please? No. This always happens. Every time we talk about technology, the technology fails. So that, that's an important lesson, yeah? It's like, um, obviously, um, for households, one thing you want to be sure is like, well, will this work? Yeah, you're going to do all of these changes. How is it going to impact um, the energy services, you know, my use of electricity in, in the home? <clears throat> ah. Right, let's see. Ah, so we have a different one on the, on the wall, which is the one I need. Uh, yes, please do. When you are feeding the energy into the grid, so there will be yeah. high peaks when you are using the, the yes. energy as a source. Okay. I was wondering, have you got any backup apart from the batteries? Because I was wondering yeah. if you cannot fully rely on. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So on this, So the, I mean, we still, but I think part of the vision is it'd still be like a national grid. So there would be backup um, electricity for days when it's not windy, it's not sunny, and the batteries are empty. So, so it could do, yeah. So part of the UK is to try and build new nuclear power stations is one policy, but they are coming very, very slowly and they're really expensive. <clears throat> and you still need to build new grid infrastructure. I'm really glad you asked this question because I've, I've forgotten a few things. Um, so the interest with the smart energy systems is, is I talked on, on the supply side, there's the renewable energy technologies, but also part of it is to um, use digital technologies to try and change the pattern of energy demand activities in the home. So you're right. With, there's always like a peak 
of energy demand in the morning and there's a peak in the evening when people wake up and when they come home from work. That's the kind of conventional, yeah? And so part of, part of the idea with these energy systems is to use um, what they call dynamic energy prices. So the price of energy will adjust during the day to try and incentivize people to reduce their demand from move their demand from peak time energy into other times of the day. So you would, you would program your washing machine maybe to come on at night, yeah, when there might be electricity stored in the batteries in the neighborhood, yeah, uh, and you can use as electricity to be used. And you would you'd make the prices very, very high in the evening when there's to, to try and reduce the demand. So the, the engineering vision if you, is to try and um, create market incentives so that people will shift their demand and, and these peaks that you get will reduce, but also to try and encourage people to use high energy activities when there is lots of sunlight and lots of wind and so forth. Yeah. And so some of the studies have been trying to model all of this to see, you know, will this work? How, how much backup electricity do we need? Included in those studies have been saying, well, okay, if we um, decarbonize the energy system, um, it's on the slide, I forget the number. If we can do it in a smart way, in this dynamic energy system, then we can use the electricity networks, the wires, much more efficiently. And we won't have to invest so much in really big wire infrastructure because we'll be using the local networks for most of the electricity um, demand, production and consumption. So, um, no, oh yeah, no, it's RSC, RSC, está bien, oh no, está bien, sí. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so this is the number. So the, the models, I estimate that by, by 2050, Doing electricity in a smart way will we'll save the country. Be, you'll need to invest 16 billion pounds less than if you just sort of went for, um, you didn't use these digital technologies. If you were just trying to meet, put in enough generating power technology to meet the peaks in demand, then you'd have to invest 16 million, billion pounds more each year by 2050 to build the infrastructure to do this. Yeah. I don't know. If, so, I mean, I mean, the simple answer is nobody knows, yeah, because yeah. So, in I, this is where it probably is different by country. So, in the UK, we have um, the the companies that own the the, the networks are different to the utility companies. Well, it's really complicated, but, but yeah, it's a different business. It can be within the same empresa, yeah. But, um, and so the investment in the the, the, the networks is is decided through regulations and, and, and policies and so forth. And then, it, it's, then there's questions of how much other companies pay to access their networks, et cetera. So this is the part of the complication, yeah. Is, is how to govern these changes. And, um, uh, but all of this, it will only work if, if the households, if enough households participate, yeah? So it needs, it needs, you know, if we have 28 million UK households, maybe you need like 20 million, you know, or a big, you, you need enough of them being flexible and shifting their demand and making sure they only um, use electricity when there's a lot of electricity stored in batteries or renewable el electricity around. Yeah, you, for the system to work, it needs good participation and good flexibility from the households. It also needs a lot of households to agree to invest in the technologies. And it's not clear that um, many of them have the money to do that. Remember, there's there's 9 million households in fuel poverty, so they can't even pay for electricity. There's no, you know, where are they going to get the money from to buy the panels, et cetera? So 
it then starts begging questions about investment models, you know, and, and where, where does this change kind of come from, if you like. So, yeah. The kind of backup behind this, like you say, what happens when there's not enough electricity to go around is we don't know. I mean, the, the, the trust is that the technology will be able to manage things and, and, and our behaviors will adapt to making use of the electricity that's available. But there's so many unknowns about this and there's only so much you can do through like engineering modeling and thinking about this. So it becomes really important to think about how do you include householders in all of these innovations, okay? To see if these ideas and these demonstration projects will really work at, at scale. Um, so that's, that's kind of what we wanted to investigate in, in the research. That's what we were particularly interested in is, okay, there are many demonstration projects around the UK that look like this, but how have households and how have citizens participated in these demonstrations? How, how have the designers of the demonstration projects, which will be a partnership between a utility company, a network owner or operator, maybe um, the, an energy regulator, different sort of organizations, they, they collaborate in these projects and they recruit households. But how, how are these sort of um, the managers of these demonstration projects, how have they seeing the households? How do they understand the households? How are they thinking about involving them? And then what do the households think as well? And so to answer those sorts of questions, <coughs> excuse me, we, um, we use this simple idea about inclusive innovation, the ladder of inclusive innovation. Some of you may recognize this. This is the ladder of citizen participation. And basically it was developed by someone called Sherry Arnstein in the late 1960s. And she was actually, I mean, relevant to, to work ETD is doing. She was involved in the urban um, regeneration projects and programs in the US in different cities in the 1960s. So part of the war on poverty there was to improve neighborhoods and invest in poorer neighborhoods. And, and the, the money to do that, millions and millions of dollars, had a, had a clause attached. One of the, the, the conditions for that money was to have citizen participation in the projects. So the neighbors were supposed to be involved in the spending of the money to improve their neighborhoods and in the design of the improvements and projects. <coughs> And she noticed that the ideal would be that the citizens would be in control. Okay, there's this money. What do we do with it in our neighborhood? How do we distribute it? The citizens would deliberate and be in control. So they wouldn't be doing it on their own. There would be planners and there would be, you know, uh, community development specialists. There'd be specialists involved, but the kind of decision-making power rested with the citizens. The experts were available as partners, but they weren't imposing things. And that was the sort of the top of the ladder of citizen participation. And then down at the bottom is manipulation. So this is where, you know, actually the planners, we know, we'll, 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 we'll organize a workshop or we'll listen to some, some residents. Actually, we'll choose the residents to invite, the ones who will kind of just say yes. And we will manipulate them and get just, a, it just a, it's a kind of get the um, show that we've done some participation, but it's quite tokenistic and we can carry on doing the projects as we decided. And then there are various kind of steps on the ladder in between, okay? It's very normative. There's an implication here that the top of the ladder is much is good and the bottom of the ladder is bad. You can see some of the, the, the language that she used, okay? And we could have a discussion about that. Actually, maybe sometimes kind of non-participation, maybe this is okay sometimes, and maybe other times this is really important, you know, it depends. There's, but there's, So it's important perhaps not to read this as like a kind of something you have to climb up necessarily. What's more important, I think, is to just consider the advantages and disadvantages of different steps on the ladder. For us, we were interested in, we weren't interested in urban change, we were interested in innovations in energy systems, the previous diagram. So we were really interested in a, a kind of adaptation of this framework this developed by Richard Heeks and colleagues, which talks about the ladder of inclusive innovation, okay? 
So, and you can see here a, a short summary of the different steps on the ladder of inclusive innovation. So we can try and see, decide how inclusive an innovation activity is, a demonstration project for smart energy, for example, how have households been included in that or, 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 or any other actor, you know, but <clears throat> you take the actor you're, in, you're interested in and inc including and you think, well, how are they being included into this program? And is it just inclusion of intent? So don't worry. The innovators kind of claim to respond to the marginalized and normally excluded groups, but, but we take them into account, but we, you know, indirectly, but you know, we don't really involve them in any way. Okay, we just try and think what might be their their needs, and we make sure we include them in our innovations. Okay. Um, another rung above that is inclusion of consumption. So we make sure that whatever the products and services are that our innovation enables, smart energy in smart energy systems, we make sure that households can become customers so they can actually make use of the, 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 the smart energy, okay? So we make sure there are processes to help them be, to become more flexible and to shift patterns of demand of their energy during the day and so forth. And then there are others as sort of making sure that actually we make sure we, we do some measuring and we make sure the impacts of the innovation are in, inclusive towards the marginalized groups. That's to say households that are normally excluded. You can imagine if so as we were saying, the 9 million households in fuel poverty, they're already marginalized from, excluded from these kind of new systems, unless we make sure that they're designed in a way that it's not going to add even more to the energy costs. So they ought to, you know, if they're using renewable energy from their rooftops and with battery storage or in the neighborhood scale, then essentially, if someone else can help with the capital costs of doing all of that, then essentially they, they get cheaper electricity. So it'll be an improvement. You know, if, if these systems make all the savings, the billions of pounds savings, then um, poorer households ought to be able to benefit from this. But that's a question of organization and governance and how do you make the organizational changes to ensure that that happens. And then right at the top of the ladder, you have inclusion of structure and what Heeks calls post-structural inclusion. This is a horrible academic term, but Inclusive structure is simply to recognize that even if you want to include poorer households or excluded groups into your innovation process, sometimes the, there are wider social structures that make it impossible for them to participate. So, I mean, a really easy example is never organize a, a workshop meeting during, during the working hours, yeah? You, maybe you organize it in the weekend or you do it at different times in the week so that people who you know, have to work or, in, you know, can actually attend and participate. But maybe there are cultural barriers as well. Maybe if you organize a meeting in a conventional university department or you're in your engineering laboratory, people are going to feel intimidated or alienated from these things. So maybe you have to go to them. You have to change the way you do your inclusion to reach out to them. But there can be other, other sources of exclusion as well. So the way the demonstration project, the assumptions, if you like, and say, well, we're the experts because we're trained engineers, or I'm, a, I'm an economist and I'm an expert. But, and, and that's all very true, but maybe there's a kind of cultural thing or there's exclusion that households don't know anything about energy. Maybe that's true as well. The households are experts in the dynamics in their household. So, you know, they're the ones who understand what goes in, on in the house. They're the ones who have to li live with the social conflicts where if you're trying to manage your battery and your renewable generation, or shift your energy demand and make sure you only use the washing machine at certain points of the day, which member of the household is that burden going to fall on? Yeah, it's gender in most households. Yeah, it'll be the woman who has to do all of that work. And then maybe the man plays with the digital technologies and starts, you know, and you can create social conflicts through these sorts of technology solutions. So you have to be really, that's why you need the inclusion of households to understand the dynamics and to work with them, yeah? So that's it, essentially. So what we did is we took this um, ladder of inclusive innovation and we went and looked at all of the different demonstration projects and we looked at all the information that we'd learned from demonstration projects to see how households were being included in these, in this, these smart energy innovations, okay? And this was, what we found was this, this yeah, sorry, I'm taking a lot of time, but... Um, 
the, the, the most demonstration projects understood inclusion or the way they were doing it was on these sort of lower rungs of the ladder because that's how they were accustomed to working with the resources available to them by the funders didn't really allow much more than this various sorts of reasons so a lot of it was looking at inclusion of consumption so they you get diagrams like this so this is a project called smart and fair organized by the center for sustainable energy working with all sorts of different indus energy industry organizations researchers um NGOs that, that represented households or the fuel poor, et cetera. And they're saying, okay, what do you, for, for a household to be kind of smart ready, to kind of be able to, um, for a household to become like this, okay, what do they need in terms of new, new skills, new capabilities in order to be a smart household, smart energy household? And this is what they found. So there's the technology readiness, that's quite obvious, yeah. Um, in terms of digital technologies, there's also having the renewable energies, you know, learning how to use and wanting to invest in batteries or small scale renewables. It may depend a little bit on your where you live and the local area. How, you know, does the local network yet allow this kind of stuff to happen? Having the money to do this, obviously, that's an important matter as well, but also personal and social. You know, do you? Do you have social networks where people are interested in this stuff? If you kind of participate and things don't work, where do you go to find out? Can you ask your neighbor to help you out, et cetera? Um, do you have the kind of lifestyle that allows you to be flexible? If you're a household where you know people work uh, shifts, so sometimes they're working in the night, sometimes they're working in the day, you know, because you work in that kind of occupation. How, how flexible can you be? You know, sometimes if you just need to get your work clothes clean or you need to get the kids' school uniforms clean, et cetera, you don't have a lot of flexibility, okay? But the basic idea is to, okay, to make sure that smart energy is inclusive then, we need to make sure that households are able to access all of these capabilities. And then they can become smart customers of the new electricity services. And so that's the dominant way of um, being of thinking about introducing these smart energy systems. This is the way of going from demonstration projects to new energy markets, new energy systems where there's a lot of smart local energy production and consumption. And it's seen as happening through marketplaces. OK, so the customers will then start um, engaging in peer to peer trading. So they might sell some electricity into the grid to their neighbors. They'll be start using digital platforms, <coughs> which are a bit like, you know, um, that allow you to kind of trade, you know, if you have a surplus of electricity in your household, you can trade it easily. You know, you just put it up onto the platform or, or this happens automatically. And then you can sell it a bit. If you need more electricity from the grid compared to what you have in your home, then you can buy it through these digital platforms. So also having an internet of, of energy, yeah? So it's very easy to trade. As they were seen as through a market model, the householders are small producers and consumers of energy, and they just trade with one another through these smart energy grids. That's the sort of vision. And the, so you're trying to build up the capabilities for households to do that. But the ladder, what was useful for us was the ladder kind of, um, so, you know, a lot of it's kind of here. And then looking at the demonstration projects, we noticed kind of absences, yeah? What kinds of inclusion are not happening? Or sometimes we would see a demonstration project that had been run by a community energy organization. So a group of neighbors get together and they say, no, we're gonna imagine a different kind of smart energy system. We're gonna, um, we're going to take elements of this. We're going to use, try and imagine these technologies within a very different kind of social organization. So the battery storage <clears throat> in people's homes, we will own collectively, okay? It will be a cooperative. It's a community battery. The solar panels, <clears throat> we'll own them as well, yeah? The flexibility between households, we will agree how we manage that together, or we'll agree the rates to do that. So if you like, their participation in this was not only as kind of flexible customers of energy companies, they were actually now producers and, and had a share in the cooperative 
business organization for using these new technologies. Okay, so quite a very radical way of thinking about future energy systems, okay, where there's a lot of social and economic innovation, not just technological innovation. Then we also saw examples where there might be some wind turbines nearby that are generating electricity. It may be a community-owned wind turbine. And they set up what they call local energy clubs where the participants coordinate when they use their electricity. So they will be flexible in using the washing machine, okay? Or they will try and persuade their kids to do their gaming less at certain times of day. But, and they would, they would model that and they would alter it to make maximum use of the electricity coming from the, the, the wind turbine they owned near to the village or town where they, they lived, okay? So then they get the maximum use of electricity that's kind of free to them because it's their electricity. And so there the incentives for kind of being flexible are different because you're trying to maximize your, your autonomy from the energy companies and so forth. Yeah. And, um, uh, and it's, it's very different kind of um, you have because you have shared ownership in it. So maybe some of the incentives are different compared to if you're just responding to these price signals that go up and down during the day and you're just trying to save a little bit of money for yourself as a household as an individual household in the, in the marketplace. Okay, so they're very different kind of organizational models involved. Sorry, I'll try and speed up a little bit. But, <clears throat> so thinking about inclusive innovation use, using the higher steps on the ladder opened up other kinds of uh, ways that households and groups could become involved collectively in different kinds of demonstration projects. A few which have been created, but many which don't exist yet. So maybe we need one needs to design products and services in these new energy systems that are much more appropriate to excluded households. <clears throat> it doesn't have to be the latest or highest technology. Maybe it's a simple thing. Oh, yeah. Okay. So not every household is the same. Maybe we need to design certain services and technologies that are much more meaningful to poorer households compared to wealthier households. The early adopters of these technologies will probably be wealthier households, yeah? And there's a risk there that you create energy systems that work for the rich households and then the poorer ones just have to put up with, you know, high prices and being a kind of slave to their electricity meter and so forth. I mentioned, you know, community-based participation and ownership with households as systems co-owners. Um, ensuring there's better representation and rights of households and household associations in some of the um, innovation forums and funding programs, et cetera, that are developing these demonstrations. Changing the basic rules of energy systems and so forth. So thinking about the ladder opens up all sorts of ways of thinking about inclusive innovation in, in different kinds of ways, okay? In the interest of times, so I won't go into it more. I'll just come to some kind of conclusions, okay? And with this slide, I want to illustrate a kind of basic dynamic, I think, that's going on in the development of smart local energy systems in the UK. And I wonder if it's, you know, it would be present in other kind of uh, similar activities in other uh, countries, if you like. The first one is a dynamic or a tendency that's kind of pushing down the ladder. It's leading to this kind of inclusion is just about building smart energy customers where there's a kind of mindset, if you like, and an approach to these new technologies that's predominant in the UK amongst the incumbent businesses and the industry is that electricity remains a commodity to be traded for profit in markets. Customers are seen as rational agents, so they respond to price signals and they have, they're flexible enough to do that. And energy for them is just a kind of purchasing decision. There's little recognition for the kind of gendered labor that has to be done in households. Uh, about you know that, that produces energy demand okay so there's you know you don't really think about households in any other way than as customers um and and you're not really attending to uh, the lack of trust in the energy sector you're assuming that people will willingly buy into and, and take part in these sorts of uh, new energy systems and become smart customers and if you like the inclusive innovation is how can we draw more households into these market relations, okay, to become smart customers. But we've maybe forgetting that actually a lot of the suppliers, are, are, there's, there's trust issues and, and complications. 
So if you don't trust your electricity supplier, and then they're saying, well, let us just come in and just run some of your, um, what's the word, devices in your home and you know, shift when things come on and come off and so forth. And the billing arrangements, so that how, you, how much you pay for your electricity is going to become really even more complicated than it is now. But, but trust us, we're going to run it in your best interests. And, and and reduce your carbon emissions and reduce your bills. If you don't really trust the people behind that, then are you really going to kind of welcome welcome those sorts of developments? So this is all this this sort of this is all pushing inclusion to the lower steps on the ladder. And then, as I say, there were a few demonstration projects and a few things happening in this this sort of <clears throat> with this experimentation that were trying to push up the ladder. And get to the higher steps of inclusion, where, and it was often coming from the world of like uh, community energy or energy communities, <clears throat> that wanted high levels of participation. So, you know, there's evidence that the public think electricity should be should be a public good, not a, not a commodity to be traded. Okay, and everyone has a right to uh, accessible electricity. There are community-based approaches that generally get positive appraisals. Um, you know, involving people through community projects and having community organisations central to these demonstration projects um, made it easier for households to kind of participate, if you like. And even industrial players saw this. So a lot of the industry-led demonstration projects would hire a community group to try and work with communities and run workshops, work with households and run workshops to try and introduce them into, into the demonstrations. They're trying to see households as co-producers of, of a collective stake in the energy system. So not seeing households as individuals and customers in marketplaces, but seeing households as neighbors and that together in a coordinated way may manage their flexibility, okay? Um, and really seeing the importance, not just of thinking of new technologies and new organizations within the same kind of political and economic energy system, but actually looking for political and economic change. So changing the ownership of the energy networks, seeing their networks as a public good and so forth, and then thinking about what kinds of new smart energy arrangements you could come up with under that, that, those sorts of changes. So rather than sort of seeing the technologies as, as drawing households more deeply into market relations and the home and, and everything in the home just being part of easy to be traded, including data uh, in smart energy systems, here you're seeing digital technologies as enabling greater autonomy from the old energy system, okay, or from the large utility suppliers. In other words, you're trying to think about in innovation that's inclusive on the much on the higher rungs of the ladder, and that's the dynamic, if you like. That's the kind of politics of smart energy systems in the UK at the moment. A much more kind of powerful tendency looking for inclusion on lower rungs of the ladder. And then on the margins, you've got organizations and groups trying to push things up the ladder. And then interestingly, you've got things in the middle where community energy groups are, are working with or pushing some energy suppliers to be much more um, aware and much more uh, thoughtful to how they bring households into these new energy services and markets. Okay. Uh, I'll skip that. And that, that's kind of it, really. I've, it's a complicated topic. I've rushed through it in English as well, rather than Spanish. So forgive me for that. But essentially what's happening, we find in the UK, is, you know, these new energy systems are being seen predominantly in engineering terms rather than sociologically. We could learn much by thinking about them a, bit, a little bit more sociologically. The technical possibilities are being filtered and understood through existing institutional arrangements. And there's, there's much you can do with that, but maybe it's creating problems as well, and it will exclude many households. Uh, and maybe we need to think about the challenges of inclusion beyond making as many households as possible smart customers and think actually maybe we need new governance models or new collaborative ways of developing these aspects of these energy systems in neighborhoods. Um, there are kind of grounds for believing that, you know, it, and if we don't do these things, then maybe many households will not want to participate in smart energy systems or they'll be excluded. And so, we'll, it, you know, it, it, for all the investment in the technology and, 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 and marketing and so forth, the systems won't work because you won't get the quality and quantity of participation that they, they assume are needed. 
Okay, and finally, um, if you want to learn more, <laughs> I brought a few copies. As I say, this is technical, very dry technical stuff. All of the pictures just are just of the technologies. So we wanted to communicate what we'd learned to politicians, actually, to members of parliament. And obviously, we've, uh, we write a policy report. And so we thought, well, that's, they, you know, they get, they get piles of them. And we'd read lots of them. And they're not the most exciting thing. So we decided to produce a comic. So there's a few copies here. And you can access it online or email me if you want to. And so in the comic, you can see here's Einstein's ladder of participation. And we wanted to put more people into the picture and the story of smart energy systems. What is happening? What are some of the challenges of inclusion? How maybe more kind of community-based approaches could be more inclusive? And just sort of illustrate that in, in, in a comic. And this was new for us. And then I was delighted when I came here to this small, earlier today to hear that, you know, ITD has been doing it as well. I'm thinking about how to write what's been happening, the energy transition in Langreal. Uh, using comics and we're thinking how we could maybe develop this a bit more uh, with comic artists so thanks for your attention um, I've covered a lot of ground and I hope some of it's sort of been interesting and helpful but anyway pues tenemos 15 minutos eh, creo que hay gente desde fuera también Mónica hay gente conectada Vale, vale. También por si acaso hay alguna, alguna pregunta. Entonces, como siempre, tenemos eh, diez minutos, un cuarto de hora para, para una conversación eh, y yo me voy a morder la lengua porque tengo muchas cosas que preguntar a, a Adrián. Así que os paso la, la palabra. ¿Quién, ¿Quién se anima a abrir el fuego? Cecilia, tú eres la tradicional, te la paso. Luego. Gracias, Adrián. Como siempre, un placer escucharte. Eh, quería saber si eh, durante la investigación en las entrevistas tuviste oportunidad de hablar con las empresas energéticas y conocer su posición ante estos nuevos modelos sí sí y la respuesta es sí yo sí. hablé y yo hice bastante de las entrevistas incluso con um, empresas algunos que son um, empresas antiguas mm. Y, pero también con empresas innovadoras, dig digamos. Hay, hay empresas o hay um, personas dentro de empresas nuevas que están intentando de crear um, nuevos modelos de negocio dentro de este, este campo. ¿sí? Por ejemplo, y, y ellos han venido del mundo, de, del mundo digital y están pensando en cómo las posibilidades de de aprovechar de los big data para manejar mejor y contratar con, con hogares en, en la red local y estas cosas, sí. Pero en general, hay, hay, hubo algunas empresas que um, tenían mucho más conciencia de los retos de participación e inclusión social que, que los demás. Pero no, no, no sé, mi impresión, mi experiencia fue, fue, fue mucho más las empresas que estaban pensando en las, los, la, las posibilidades de crear mercados nuevos, pensar en hogares como si fueran uh, unidades de actores económicos racionales y estas cosas. Sí, y muchos menos en... en um, uh, no sé, cómo escalar más arriba en las, las ¿cómo se dice? En la escalera y llegar a, 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 a arriba. Pero hay un, y vi un, un una hay, hay interesantes um, uh, híbridos, hmm. ¿sí? Por ejemplo, Octopus Energy, que ya, ya está en España, ¿sí? Octopus Energy en el Reino Unido es muy innovador y ha aprendido de los Um, local energy clubs y intentan de, de um, incentivar a los hogares, los, sí, los vecinos, para manejar su energía, para poner la demanda um, 
coordinar su demanda con, con la, la disponibilidad de energía renovable local. Entonces, están desarrollando un, un modelo de negocio que es un poco como el, la voluntad y el, la energía comunitaria. ¿sí? Entonces, son estos híbridos que son muy, muy interesantes. Y el problema, el resto es, es hay un, um, ¿cómo se dice? Hace falta un plataformas de crear diálogos y crear estos híbridos entre las los, los, los demostraciones distintas, ¿sí? Bueno, es una respuesta más sí. Es una respuesta perfecta, sí. sobre todo porque pensaba que a medida que eh, quieres moverte hacia arriba en la Social Innovation Ladder, sí. en realidad lo que estás haciendo es eh, moviendo también el centro de poder, ¿no? Sí. O sea, entonces... Yo ahí es donde veo muchas veces la dificultad de, de modelos que mantienen los economic assumptions classics sí. de demanda ¿no? y clientes, in, intentar cambiarlo con, con eso tan clásico primero sí. y después que esa mayor participación real justamente eh, le quita poder a empresas como las energéticas uh -huh. que están históricamente acostumbradas a tener oligopolios, a sí. tener un control muy específico, ¿no? Y toda la teoría económica los avala y los economistas hoy que se están formando en las universidades sí. también tienen la misma forma de pensar. Entonces, sí. no, 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 es, es solo es, una es, reflexión, ¿eh? Perdón, no, Mónica, podemos not a en la pared porque sí, sí. No, 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 pero Cecilia es fundamental la cuestión de, de poder y um, ahora vamos a okay, pelear. sí es mira, hay una no va oh. bueno hay hubo un, una cita en una de las de las diapositivas eh, um, de um, que básicamente dice que hay proyectos organizados por organizaciones comunitarias, community energy organizations. Um, households were much happier participating in them because they knew that the values of the community organization, the, the business, the cooperative, were the same as theirs. So they, they, trust was really important. And knowing that they were a member, a valued member of the organization. Because it's important, most, most people in most households don't have time to worry about this. So they want, to, they want to know that the people running the network and the business providing the energy and, and that they're helping to produce the system because you have to allow your home to be run like a producer and a, of, of energy, yeah? So you're, you're part of the, the new energy system. So I think it does then get to really fundamental questions of kind of ownership, and the ideology of what energy is. Um, one thing we, we've, we've found, and I would like to do more research on, is, is if you start thinking of household activities, like, okay, changing demands, when do I use the, wash the, the kids' laundry, yeah? There's, there's lots of research around what they call energy housekeeping, all of the different activities you need to reduce your energy demand in wealthy countries, or to become a smart energy user and learning how to use the new technologies, okay? The work you have to put into deciding what kind of panels to buy or how to use the software. There's also lots of research in what you call, is also called digital housekeeping or digital care. And the same with all of our digital technologies. We put lots of work, lots of labor into the system to make it work. So, and no one's really looking at this in terms of labor. It's labor that's really gendered as well in the household. It's labor that's also includes some, some forms of labor are recognized more than others. There's a kind of class element to this as well. If you're in a wealthy household, you can buy more of the technologies to do the flexibility and reduce your demand behind the scenes. Yeah. If you can't afford to buy the technologies, if you're from a poorer household, like a working class household, then someone in the household will have to do the flexibility manually. You can't have... So there's, and so we've just put in a, a research proposal to look at the social labor involved in the reproduction of these systems. 
And there we, we're learning from, from like feminist scholarship around social reproduction and some of the autonomous in, in the feminist studies of various sorts that say, look, that, you know, in the home, all sorts of work happens to reproduce people for the economic system. And if our homes are becoming part of the new energy system, then we need to think of the labor and the work that's going into that. And I, the reason I think that is important is because um, to build the legitimacy and the trust in the system, people want to be included fairly. And so this question of just transitions means recognizing new forms of labor. You know, maybe we, may, maybe in, I mean, at the bigger scale with energy sustainability transitions, all of us are gonna to have to learn new routines, learn how to recognize new organizations, learn to trust in, you know, you think about in food, in, in housing, mobility, cities. And so then where, how are we gonna get that labor recognized? When are we gonna get the time for it? And so then I think there's interesting connections with things like, you know, four day weeks. And maybe, you know, maybe we just need to give people time and reduce the working week to allow people to kind of look, make these changes and, 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 and so forth. I don't know, that's, that's going too far ahead and that's quite a, um, a radical suggestion. And the, but the first thing is just to recognize all of the, the work that the different kind of people have to do in these new energy systems and not just see them as social actors and, and technologies and, and that's it. So yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, go on. Hola, Adrián. Eh, quería saber si en el proyecto, o sea, en la investigación, eh, encontraron algunos pilotos o ejemplos a una escala distinta a las casas. Es decir, en las casas se cambia el hábito, digamos, de, de acuerdo a la demanda, cambiamos el hábito y el y ponemos la lavadora a diferentes horas, pero es una decisión familiar en un ámbito concreto familiar. Pero quería saber si en el proyecto encontraron ejemplos de cambios de hábitos a nivel de una estructura distinta, por ejemplo, un hospital, un colegio, ah, sí. eh, donde sí. implica un cambio, o sea, un, una, sí. un cambio estructural de cambiar horarios de servicios, o sea, un, a una escala más grande, digamos, qué tanta flexibilidad hay cuando cambió la escala del proyecto, no a casa, si me enfrento a, a bancos, o sea, a una estructura de servicios. Sí, sí. Cárceles, bueno, lo que sea, sí. Es muy, muy buena pregunta. No, en, en nuestro caso no, porque, bueno, no es, entonces es un buen ejemplo, ¿no?, de la importancia de la inclusión, porque nuestra suposición fue los hogares, la vivienda fue un acto excluida Claro. Pero tú has introducido, nos has introducido actores diferentes don, en, en los que hay un, estructuras de enseñanza, claro. de, no sé, la, la dinámica de, de la, del día cotidiano o la, las temporadas. Sí, entonces hay un proyecto, bueno, es, sí, ya, tenemos ya. que aprender, ¿no? Este, claro, porque es otro, otro reto. Bueno, entonces, sí. si, si, no, si no cambiaron de escala en la escala de la casa, mm. Eh, la brecha digital o la brecha de conocimiento de sí. los niños respecto a los eh, adultos, no sé si la, la han abordado, o sea, digamos, porque es distinto el conocimiento, la percepción de un niño frente a ese cambio sí. tecnológico respecto a los adultos, que toda la tecnología está es orientada a las aplicaciones y todo, orientada sí. es a los adultos, pero faltan los niños y se están enfrentando a un ámbito familiar, no sé sí. si también, porque también me estoy enfrentando yo en un proyecto de este tipo donde veo que hay una eh, falta, eh, que todo este cambio tecnológico tenga esa derivada de, para, de orientada hacia, hacia los niños, no, no hay. Sí. Entonces sí. eso también lo veo. Sí. Perdón, para complementar la, la pregunta, que con, con respecto a la edad, pasa también eh, al revés, o sea, la gente, la, adultos mayores en Madrid al menos, eh, para postular a una subvención para rehabilitar energéticamente la vivienda hay que subir cerca de 30 documentos digitales y eso también deja inmediatamente fuera a, a, otro, a otro colectivo vulnerable, a otra parte de la población. Entonces, ¿cómo? Eh, y no sé si pudieron andar más, es justo lo que decías tú, hablabas del trabajo, del género, eh, si es que pudieron andar más en los impactos sociales o la, o la, la falta de, ciertas, de ciertos conocimientos, ciertas capacidades que se necesitan 
para que la innovación tecnológica tenga cierto éxito. O sea, que, que sí. en este momento puede ser una barrera, como decías tú, que mucha gente no puede acceder por, por, eh, por falta de recursos económicos o por otro, otro, otro tipo de recursos sí. o, o conocimientos que son necesarios para que la política tenga el éxito que necesitamos que, que tengan. Sí. Sí, sí, no, 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 me, no, sí, me, no, 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 mejor, mejor que escuchamos a, a los demás, ¿no? Sí, sí. Ahora aquí, preguntas muy breves, aquí teníamos una bonita también quería preguntar. Preguntas, opinión. Sí, o comentarios, no sé, sí, sí, sí. Bueno, yo lo, lo he comentado contigo esta mañana, pero me gustaría sí. andar un poquito más. Si está presente el papel de la domótica un poco en en la domótica, o sea, como programar, como las casas Alexa, ah, sí, para que eso, sí. sí está presente el papel en, en un poco todo el estudio, ¿no? Y o sea, cómo puede mejorar y también sobre la brecha digital de pues un poco las, las, la, la clase económica, ¿no? Pues cómo, cómo afecta en, en esa domótica. Sí. Y una última. Yo quería decir que me parece fascinante eh, lo que estáis haciendo. Lo único que eh, creo que el, el sistema de centralizar la energía es fundamental para reducir la pobreza energética, eso lo entiendo. Sí. Pero, por ejemplo, ahí pones 7 millones de familias. Todas, yo entiendo que todas esas familias viven en, en áreas, eh, por ejemplo, en el norte de Inglaterra, donde eh, no, 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 no poseen, no, no tienen la propiedad de esa casa. Esas casas sí. a lo mejor están... Eh, por ejemplo, 20.000 casas pertenecen a, a una autoridad local o quizás a, sí. a, una, a una empresa que subsidiaria de la sí. esta local. ¿Hay algún incentivo para estas empresas eh, en, en implementar todos esos avances, avances tecnológicos? Porque al final ellos se van a llevar el, el pago, el coste de sí. un servicio, pero se van a, los que se benefician van a ser al final sí. los consumidores. ¿Hay algún incentivo para estas compañías para implementar todo eso? Que me parece fantástico, pero... Sí, es que funciona. En el, bueno, en el sector de alquiler privado son casi ni, ningún incentivo. O sea, es un, muy, un gran problema. En el Reino Unido, el sector privado de, de alquiler cada vez es más y más grande. ¿sí? Y en el sector público, vivienda que pertenece al... Al, la, al ayuntamiento a la, sí, o una asociación de vivienda pública, hay posibilidades y de hecho han instalado tecnologías y estas cosas subvencionadas, ¿sí? porque hay, hay un esencio interés cuidar por las familias para que acceden a energía de coste barato, que es limpia, etc. Pero no, no sabemos todavía cómo y más allá de, del sector público a, a la vivienda de alquiler privada, ¿sí? En términos de la, 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 las otras cosas como en, en no, no, recu no recuerdo bien, esta de edades diferentes o perfiles de pers personas dentro de, 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 de la casa, estas cosas. Hay estudios, pero en nuestro proyecto no, no, no teníamos um, tiempo ni Sí, no fue el enfoque. Sí, entonces la idea, con, si, si conseguimos el dinero para hacer este proyecto de, de, de labor dentro de la casa, vamos a trabajar, entrar dentro de la casa para entender las, las dinámicas también. Y también tenemos ganas de investigar el trabajo que hace asociaciones vecinales o organizaciones comunitarias que apoyan a las familias también, ¿eh? estas cosas. Pero hay, no sé, hay un, hay un montón de cosas para darse en cuenta. ¿Qué significa? Es, es, el, aunque crea mercados y incentivos a través del price mechanism, es muy, muy poderoso, ¿sí? Pero en caso de, de cambios como este, es difícil imagina una manera de hacerlo de una manera inclusiva y, 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 y que es no, perdón me he pedido el, la línea sí, pero entonces um, 
Es por eso que estamos convencidos que necesitamos innovar los modelos de gobernación y estas cosas y entrar mucho más profundamente en estos asuntos para garantizar que la tecnología va a funcionar. Hay un acto que no está aquí y cuando estábamos creando el, el cómic y es, hay una suposición que los recursos materiales para construir estos sistemas existen. Y cuando estamos hablando de, de baterías, y esto es como estamos hablando de litio, etc. ¿sí? Y hay comunidades por otro lado del mundo que sufren conflictos sociales por esta demanda aquí en la Europa. Entonces, al mismo tiempo de pensar en una, sistemas energéticos nuevos, inclusivos, tenemos que pensar a nivel internacional también. Sí, sí. Entonces, ¿cómo vamos a aprovechar de estos recursos materiales de una manera muy sabia, wise, sí? que es suficiente? Quizás tenemos que empezar diálogos de pensar en, no sé, a entrar en asuntos muy difíciles. O sea, ¿Qué es un, una cantidad suficiente de electricidad para una familia dentro de estas condiciones de hasta para no sobre el diseño sistemas que van a crear problemas o injusticias por otro lado del mundo estas cosas también ya estamos pensando en, en la economía circular en términos, en términos de la refabricación de paneles fotovoltaicos estas cosas bueno, bueno hay bastante trabajo no y bastante puestos futuros para hacer estas cosas. Muchísimas gracias, Adrián. Yo creo que vamos a, a terminar ya, a no ser que alguien tenga... Siempre podéis quedaros con Adrián un rato sí. para seguir aquí. Está de vacaciones en Madrid. Yo le agradezco <risa> muchísimo está con su familia, eh, que echaban sus hijas de menos Madrid. Sí, y, sí. Belán y tu mujer también. Y a pesar de estar de vacaciones, está, está aquí con... Con nosotros. Sí, eh, sí, han tenido una vacación de, de su padre. Por... Sí, 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 sí. Y, eh, y bueno, eh, estamos, estamos en, en lo mismo, sí. eh, pensando no, en no. todas estas cuestiones que nos plantea la, la necesidad de, de, de actuar, de, de experimentar, de aprender, de cuestionarnos todo. Pero al mismo tiempo no paralizarnos y hacer, hacer cosas. Yo veía la, la escalera de, de la participación y de la innovación y para eh, eh, no renunciar a lo que está más arriba, pensaba en entornos como la universidad donde, ¿por qué no? El consumo de la energía, de los recursos, etcétera, podría ser realmente... Eh, gestionado de, de otra manera, con un poder de la, de la sí. comunidad eh, diferente y extender de ahí a otros sitios, bueno, pues es una posibilidad difícil, no, pero no... no... ¿Es, una es una ciudad. Es una ciudad, es una ciudad que se puede manejar sí. como una comunidad energética. Ahora estamos cerrando con el Ministerio de Universidades, bueno, ya se ha cerrado un acuerdo para colaborar universidades y ciudades con experimentos que se hagan a escala de un campus y puede ser un tema uh, interesante. Si, si sale, ya te, sí. te llamaremos para que nos, nos ayudes sí. a sistematizar todo ese, ese trabajo. Sí. Eh, estamos viendo que esto mismo es reproducible en otros sectores que tienen que transformarse, como es la rehabilitación urbana, como es la alimentación, eh, como es también la manera en la que nos movemos en la ciudad. Eh, y de verdad, Adrián, gracias por compartir no, gracias tu, vos, tu trabajo y tu, tu conocimiento. Y gracias a que nos habéis acompañado hoy. Y os decía que habéis tomado una buena decisión. Venid, espero que, que hayáis confirmado que era, merecía la pena estar con, con Adrián en este rato. Muchísimas gracias. Bueno, gracias. Gracias. Gracias.